Blog Talk Radio. You've just entered Uncaden Dimensions. Chief Officer for this assignment is Special Agent Adam Dorightly of the Majesty's Secret Service. So prepare yourself for Uncaden Dimensions Radio. on Mars. You're listening to another startling episode of Untamed Dimensions with me, your host, Adam Gorightly, and brought to you as always by our sponsors, the ancient Illuminated Seers of Bavaria, the world's oldest and most successful secret society. Our guest today is Iona Miller. Iona is a certified hypnotherapist and writer. She has combined her experience in clinical therapy with years of training in Huian psychology science and the mystic arts to bring a unique slant to her therapeutic written and graphic work. In the forthcoming issue of uh, Paranoia, the Conspiracy Reader, Iona has an article therein entitled, Tom Bearden, 0.0, Wizard of Zero Point. If all of this wasn't enough, uh, apparently Iona is somehow involved with the intelligence community. Hell, I'm not exactly sure, but I'll do my darndest to find out today, so... uh, here she is, without further ado, Iona Miller. Hello, Iona. Hi, Adam. Greetings to you, and good to be talking with you again. Yeah, very nice to hear your uh, voice again. I might describe my current intelligence capacity as somewhat of a spy whisperer. A spy whisperer. Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that like a horse whisperer? Yes, only applied to intelligence personnel somewhat in a consulting capacity. Well, how how does that uh, work? Uh, let me ask you, the last time you visited us, I billed you as a performance artist for the CIA, as you had listed yourself <laughs> as such on your website. And uh, so one of the reasons I indeed invited you back today was f- to find out exactly what you mean when you said you were a performance artist for the CIA and also a uh, s- sort of spook whisperer. Spy whisperer. Okay. Um, Well, that's a tall order. Uh, This sort of evolved from our subject today, uh, Mankind Research Unlimited, led me into associations with a number of people in the intelligence community, uh, both in science intelligence and in uh, intelligence and counterintelligence. And one of the people that I'm working with is a former case officer for CIA, And, of course, I also do online performance art, so I was making a joke, but I think that last time I said to you, aren't we all performance artists for CIA in some, you know, twisted sense? Mm -hmm. And um, talk a bit, uh, if you would, before we bring on our other guest, and I'll let you introduce him. I believe we have him on the line. Uh, 
mm-hmm. about this group, MRU, which is Mankind Research Unlimited, who I guess were a sort of East Coast version of SRA, the Stanford Research in- Institute that was involved in remote viewing and other forms of uh, psychic research in the 70s at the behest of certain uh, alphabet intelligence agencies. Could you speak about this group and the, all the types of things you were involved in and who were some of the principal players? Well, MRU was a little spookier than SRI in that uh, it kind of operated under the radar and it never really sought or got the kind of publicity that SRI did because uh, SRI did many projects that were not related to the paranormal as well. Uh, MRU was directed by Dr. Carl Schleicher, who uh, had a background in intelligence and was... uh, got a pretty serious interest in the paranormal. And back in these days, in the early 70s, there were so many things floating around to investigate uh, in terms of alternatives that he was just willing to check them all out and leave no stone unturned in that regard. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was involved uh, in the translation of of, uh, some materials that produced Ostrander and Schroeder's psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain, Yes, which is probably one of the books that led a lot of people into parapsychology early on. Um, and there were many other associates there as well, Dr. Chris Bird and uh, Dr. Eldon Bird, and, you know, kind of a cast of thousands. It's mm-hmm. sort of a uh, roster of who's who in that arena. Was there a crossover with SRI? Not to my knowledge. I don't think there was a direct crossover. Uh, And Carl himself refused to ever admit that he was working directly for CIA. And I have been able to find no evidence to show that that's a fact at all. But I do have some evidence and testimony to show that he was linked to Naval Intelligence and NSA. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Naval Intelligence was one of the uh, key players, it's been alleged, in mind control. And in an email, you referred to this Dr. Uh, Carl Schleicher as the uh, real cigarette man and the father of the Manchurian candidate. Uh, Certainly, these uh, types of uh, activities extend uh, beyond the typical psychic experiments, you know, that... uh, SRI was involved in and into human experimentation of the darkest kind. Well, possibly, but that link is not solid. The allegation that he was the father of the cyborg or Manchurian candidate was made by A.J. Weberman Uh when he kind of outed Carl and MRU in the Covert Intelligence Bulletin in 1980. This was after the Senate hearings on MKUltra in 1977. And so he alleges that, and Carl certainly had those um, interests and capacities, let's say. But whether he was actually involved, there's no direct link that I've been able to establish. Mm -hmm. As far as the cigarette man, he's just a perfect candidate and almost a dead ringer (laughs) look-alike. What were some of the uh, allegations that uh, A.J. Weberman made, and uh, what did he base these on? Well, he based them on the fact that he had finagled getting into the office. Of, of course, he, of course, he was a, a famous garbologist, A.J. Yes, Weberman. Yes, a famous garbologist. He dug around the garbage of Bob Dylan and was able to make, uh, you know, deductions based on that. Yeah. And then some of them, admittedly, were pretty far out. Yeah. And uh, what he did is he got this entree to the office, and he asked if they could spend the night there. And I guess what he must have done was just rummage around and find some materials that he used to compile his story from. Most of them are just the takeaway brochures for the agency and what the interests and applications were. And so I think he did a little more research on that as well, but it's mm-hmm. hard to say. You know, that's that's one reason I was trying to ferret out for myself the truth from the, you know, wild allegations of what that was by talking with people who were from MRU. 
Yeah. Now, let me just say that my first introduction to this came in the early 70s because my now ex-husband, Richard Allen Miller, had been the uh, Northwest Regional Director for MRU and had conducted studies in Kirlian photography and psychic surgery and some work with Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama on psychokinesis. So, um, you know, I had the inside track on it from the beginning, and right. he and I are still involved in an, an organization called OAK, Organization for the Advancement of Knowledge, uh, that's still pursuing some of this, what's generally called blue sky research. Mm -hmm. science, now, intel science intelligence when it's applied, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to those sorts of things. How was... Uh MRU funded? Not very well, apparently. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's the question that uh, comes to mind, you know, when you look at SRI, uh, you could you know, trace the uh, funding to the certain uh, $13 million. Dollars. Yeah. Well, I can categorically say MRU never enjoyed that kind of largesse. Okay. And was, you know, you might just say marginal at best, sometimes better than others. But uh, because of that, I think that's additional proof that no massive government contracts were awarded there. Now, it, it, Carl it, pursued things based on his own resources. Mm -hmm. We have on the uh, line, I believe, a fellow who is the deputy director of Mankind Research Unlimited, MRU. Would you like to introduce him? Uh, Charles Stone was actually the deputy director, I believe, of Mankind Research Foundation, which followed MRU. And, uh, you know, he has his own tale to tell. The interesting thing about talking to people from MRU is that they all have a different story. And so perhaps he'd like to introduce himself and tell what his is. When you originally invited me on, you asked me to talk about these uh, spooks and science intelligence people, and I thought it would be much more effective to have them speak for themselves. So, Charles, would you like to introduce yourself? That's right. I'm calling right here from Washington, D.C., and uh, my office on Pennsylvania Avenue, and uh, I have uh, about seven blocks in the White House, and I... Um, uh, do a lot of different things. Some of them started with uh, when I worked with uh, Mankind Research Unlimited, and it was actually my first job in Washington with as Carl's deputy. Um, and at that time, Carl had a, a small townhouse or a townhouse in uh, Silver Spring at a great location uh, that he carried on all these activities that he'd started in a much bigger uh, uh, facility that he had in uh, Calorama Road in the Embassy District. And that's when he was much better, when he was funded on a larger scale. Uh, but uh, Carl was carrying on many types of activities and many projects to try to make the world a better place. And he was doing it in, you know, like uh, Frank Sinatra said, I think, uh, doing it his way or whatever, you know, and that was Carl's way of doing things. And, uh, and Carl was a very smart man and he was, uh, you know, well intentioned to, to try to save the world, but he was often not the best person to, uh, in dealing with people, though. <laughs> uh, what were some of the uh, experiments he was involved with? Well, let me just tell you some of the main programs that uh, why I was brought in. I have a background as a biomedical scientist, and uh, my sponsor in graduate school is one of the founders of some of the major units at NIH and so forth. Um, and uh, he was involved. He had a, a several projects for AIDS. Uh, drug, uh, drug and alcohol abuse. He had uh, some of these advanced learning projects and so forth. Um, he had many uh, projects for affordable housing. Uh, and then he had several smaller or, uh, organizations that he ran along with uh, MRU that were on the door of the, of the when, you, when you came in the office. Um, and uh, I can't, I don't want to get into too many names mentioned here to, to confuse things, but uh, uh, there are a number of alternative therapies that, that do work for AIDS and that can, could be used to treat from, from that time in the late 1980s uh, that we tried to popularize with the federal government. Uh, there are all some other approaches that many people have worked on for, to try to get the government interested for cancer therapy and so forth that, that, may, that uh, 
uh, had the uh, effort been been made to develop these going back into the 1930s, uh, that there would be uh, more, much more effective and cheaper therapies available for not only uh, cancer but but probably other types of uh, me- medical medical conditions. Uh, yes, I we also interject. One of those was blood irradiation. Yes, one one was blood irradiation, but there are many other ones that go back to. Uh, what came from uh, r- radionics and so forth from that period of time. If those had been allowed to, to develop, uh, we would have many more types of therapies that would be kind of strange to, to our minds th- th- these days. But had they been allowed to, to develop, we would have had many types of uh, therapies available for not only AIDS and cancer and other, other you know, lethal uh, ailments. Uh, we also had electronic means that are used for drug and alcohol abuse. Of course, uh, the, at that time in the late 80s, the, the drug way was killing the country. And uh, people were, uh, in terms of crime, in terms of people who were using drugs, people were involved in drug trade and, and so forth, the whole picture was was bad bad for the country. And uh, we had a way of, of treating uh, most people who were, uh, dr- drug addicts, except the most uh, severe cut types, I'd say at least 90% of the people can be treated electronically. Uh, this has been done on a large scale in in China, for, especially in Hong Kong, for years, where you know uh, heroin abuse is 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 endemic in China, and uh, this this could have been used in the United States much earlier and could have uh, created this could have stopped many of the problems that, that we've had over the years. So those are several of the major approaches, the uh, projects that we're working on. We had a lot of them, and uh, again, so I was biofeedback a, was the application. Well, there was the biofeedback was uh, not uh, uh, that was not one of his main programs at that time that he was working on. He when uh, he was working uh, when I worked with him, he he worked with a gentleman from uh, uh, that came over here from from uh, Russia with his uh, with his alternative learning te- te- techniques and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he'd uh, worked with the uh, little, little ladies who had uh, written the book. He mentioned Miss Miss uh, uh, Ostrander and her partner and so forth. Uh, and I, I met and worked with both those people. I met we uh, the the head of the International Psychotronic Association is another area uh, which Carl was very prominent in was the psychotronic field. And he was I, I call him the Johnny Appleseed of psychotronics. Said that he was one of his projects was to seed interest throughout the world in that field. And if I could interject, psychotronics is the mind body science, the relationship of matter, energy, and consciousness. Mind, but that's a good way to say it, yeah. And how is uh, psychotronics applied? Is this the type of electronic therapy you're talking about? Using well, no, the, the electronic therapy I'm talking about for drug and alcohol abuse is their, their equipment that, that that has been used to, that is electronic, which is not psychotronic in in uh, function, that, that has been used, and there's more advanced techniques. We, we work with a company right here in Columbia, Maryland, it was a that had developed some um, alternative, uh, you know, cancer therapy equipment that is that is in, in use uh, for uh, that, uh, and they they had more advanced equipment than is used in China for treating drug and alcohol abuse. They 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 could have d- developed it, and uh, uh, this was a company that used uh, that was a pioneer in using microwaves for uh, treating cancer, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and so forth, uh, but. Uh, yeah, there are several of these techniques. If they'd been allowed to come forward and develop, some, going back to the 1930s, the period of time when, uh, when when these first came out, and they were suppressed by the U.S. government, if these been allowed to develop, not only would be a lot less suffering and problems in the country over the period of time, but we would be saving a lot of money. And of course, now we have the health care crisis is killing many industries in the United States. It's a major problem. <laughs> Let's put it that way: the health care costs and of course, many people are, are not covered by health care either. So why have these therapies been suppressed? I don't know. I don't know. That's uh, we, we, we don't know the full reason, but there are many books. These books are out there. If, if, if people want to look and look to uh, and find them in the uh, on the Internet and libraries and so forth, they're, they're there. The, it's, the, the, it's not to- totally suppressed, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, some of the other areas I have interest in that go back to the World War II era that I've published internationally on the history of weapons of mass destruction in Japan and Korea. Uh, and it turns out that some of the people I met, one of the persons particularly that Carl worked with, used to come to the office all the time. 
was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Eldon Bird. And Eldon was a was a nice guy. You would never even if you saw him met him on the street, you would would not be struck by him. But uh, uh, it turned out he was one of the government's top experts on electromagnetic uh, uh, weaponry and had uh, put together a secret inventory of all the World War II technology, which uh, had been uh, confiscated from uh, from Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. There's many secret things that we still don't know that are buried in dark black black programs that who. Who knows what they all are? But I know what some you know, I've published in, in several of the areas, and uh, and uh, many years later I, I did this. I didn't know it at the time. It wasn't until just recently I found out that Elton Bird had had uh, done done all this. But he was an interesting character, and uh, of course one of the most famous uh, motion picture projects or films from the Washington area is that which people don't know about is the the Exorcist. And that was based on a reported true story of a book that was written by a Georgetown University student after World War II. And this was a, a young boy who was uh, uh, from Mount Rainier, Maryland. And uh, he was reportedly possessed and he was reportedly exercised or may have been exercised by the priests at Georgetown. And he eventually ended up at St. Saint Elizabeth, the, the mental hospital here in Washington. And it turns out that Eldon Bird uh, grew up in the same neighborhood as this kid in, in uh, prior, prior to, to World War II. And, uh, and, and Eldon Bird was not only a brilliant scientist and physicist, but he was uh, uh, very talented in certain areas like spoon bending and so forth, that he was very psychically uh, talented. And those are just some of the psychic talents that he had. That, and uh, we would actually see him during this during the time that Yuri Geller would became world famous and so forth. And we had someone I was watching who was just as good or better than Yuri Geller, you know. Mm-hmm. And so there were a lot of interesting people and characters that you would meet at at, at Mankind Research. Now, what uh, was some of the uh, secret hidden Nazi technology? Well, there are a lot of them. Let me just say, I published internationally in the history of weapons of mass destruction, in the especially in the atomic area. And we have uh, very good evidence that uh, almost certain evidence that both Germany and Japan had atomic devices or atomic terror devices ready at the end of toward the end of World War II, and that Germany was uh, had had tested these devices. We have very good. I'm sure it occurred that these devices were tested in the Baltic during the World War II era, and that they had uh, radically different atomic technology was used to produce less less fallout. You use smaller amounts of, uh, of uh, radioactive materials or fissile materials, and that uh, these were tested. And we have a document, the U.S. Naval Intelligence report, that uh, that almost certainly verifies that. It was one that I found with the help of a, a retired Air Force intelligence officer many, many years ago. Uh, but uh, it and that the the goal of the end of World War II was the uh, Battle of the Balls. Everybody thought it was a madness for. Um, you know the Austrian paper hanger himself to uh, to to have the Battle of the Bulge and to sacrifice all his troops. But he did have there was some method to his madness that uh, he was uh, he wanted to to, to uh, capture the uh, port of Antwerp in Belgium, and he had uh, they had submarines ready to fire special rockets and into England. And we we have very good evidence. I say almost certain evidence that there were atomic terror devices. That would have been used to bombard England to try to bring a some sort of stalemate or or negotiate settlement to the war at that late date, and I say it's almost certainly true that all this happened, and or would have happened had uh, had uh, the uh, Nazi tank commanders taken a little bit different route during the Battle of the Bulge, actually. And uh, I'm an expert on that area too, but yeah. uh, but there's uh, many aspects of the story that uh, that. that had a few things gone differently, it, it could have been a lot, much more uh, different than, than than we know about. Uh, there was a Nazi general who was their top SS technical general. His name was General Hans Kammler. He disappeared after World War II with much of this technology. We we don't know exactly where he went or what happened to all of it and so forth. I assume that much of it is in these black pro- programs, but I'm sure some of it was carried on in Argentina and many other places too. You know. How much didn't of it? That, excuse me. Didn't you at one point, Charles, imply that some of the paperclip scientists from Germany were associated with MRU? Uh, I had uh, thought I saw that in the uh, Weberman uh, article, 
and then I went back over and I, I couldn't find the, the exact names in, in, in the article, but some, somebody had, had made that uh, implication, but I, I couldn't find them when I, when I looked at it again. You know, Or perhaps some of their research was carried forward there. Yes, there's a possible that uh, uh, the, this, the theory is that uh, uh, that the uh, when the Nazis had all this advanced t- technology in the, w- the war that was uh, that was far in advance of anything that, that we had or the Russians had, and the and that this uh, they they carefully organized uh, where they who they surrendered to and what would happen with all this, and and that that these programs were carried on in other countries. And there's even one writer who thinks that uh, has a very very impressive uh, several impressive books that, that suggest that there's uh, some sort of uh, uh, guiding influence from the uh, Nazi uh, that uh, uh, institution or organizations were carried forward from that period of time to to carry carry this work on that and it centrally operated from the what what he calls the Nazi International or the mm-hmm. the uh, the Fourth Reich or so forth so. That that's a possibility, and we don't, you know, there are various parts. I, I won't go any further than that, but uh, there have been many implications of that over the years, you know. That it has been imported into the uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence network. Yeah, partly through the intelligence network and, and the te- technology networks too, and the and so forth, and uh, and of course many people have brought this up over the years, but there's more and more evidence that it actually did occur, and that there. Or that something like this may, may have occurred, and there, that that this, there's more evidence coming out about the uh, uh, technology that was developed in Nazi Germany, and and what happened to it, and how it affected the end of World War II, and the kind of as you look at it, it was a very kind of a strange ending of the war, you know. Any theories on uh, UFOs? It was uh, it's been uh, alleged that uh, the Nazis uh, had developed. Uh, anti-gravity craft or the uh, Foo Fighters that were seen? Right. The Foo, Foo Fighters are the most obvious of those crafts that were that were developed. That's very well documented. It's known wh- where they were built, what, what what department of the SS actually built them and so forth, how they worked, what what were what type of cholesterol tubes were in those uh, Foo, Foo Fighters and so forth. Uh, there's a, a lot more evidence, not as well documented, that they were much bigger Electrogravitic d- d- devices or UFOs. Uh, these were devices that created an artificial gravity field and were able to propel themselves, partly using the uh, the uh, artificial gravity field, uh, using high voltage uh, type of uh, circumstances. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are other possible ways of of creating um, you know UFO pr- propulsion too. But that's that's the most obvious. That's the easiest to reproduce and do. You know. Um, and uh, there's very good evidence that the uh, that the uh, Nazis had this going, that this was developed by special parts of the uh, of the uh, German uh, advanced uh, black programs, you know, and that these were developed during the 20s and 30s, especially in the 30s and 40s, and that there there may have been. We we, we don't know exactly how big these were and how how far they it, it did go. There are many rumors and there may. Uh, diagrams and books you can buy, but we I don't I don't personally know exactly how how, how far it went. You know. Do you think uh, some of the uh, modern day sightings of UFOs can be attributed to this technology? Yes, there are many people who believe that most UFO sightings are actually uh, from from this planet and came from these types of, of technologies. And some people who were some of the first people who were. Uh, abductees who were um, uh, studied by real psychiatrists in a scientific way and so forth give a description of someone if it's a the uh, the image of a of an SS uh, person you know and, and so forth someone who was very authoritative and so forth mm-hmm. rather than a, an alien um, and so it would certainly make a lot more sense that these devices aren't that you know are within the technology that we have to 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 build and uh, and the technology is fairly well well known, and most most country most governments of the world don't know, know how to do this, you know, of any size. And right. uh, and the after World War II, the United States and the the, the former Soviet Union were were involved as, as was Britain and Canada and so forth, you know. 
At this point, we're at the uh, halfway mark of the show. We're going to take a little musical break, and we'll be back in a couple minutes, gang. Okay. All righty. You're listening to Untamed Dimensions with Adam Go Rightly, and here's Tom Jones with Thunderball. Well, maybe we won't hear Tom Jones with uh, Thunderball. Here's uh, Mel Torme with Secret Agent Man. See if this works. There's a man who leads a life of danger. Everyone he meets, he stays a stranger. With every move he makes, Another chance he takes Odds are he won't live to see tomorrow Secret agent man Secret agent man They've given you a number And taken away your name Beware of pretty faces you may find a pretty face can hide an evil mind Oh, careful what you say Don't give yourself away Odds are you won't live to see tomorrow Secret agent man Secret agent man They've given you a number And taken away your name One day, then bleeding in a Bombay alley next day. And if the wrong word slips while kissing persuasive lips, odds are you won't live to see tomorrow. Secret agent man, secret agent man, they've given you a number. Number and taken away your name. Only got a number, secret agent man. They've taken away your name. Secret agent, secret agent. He is a spy, secret agent. Bleeding in a Bombay alley, kissing every Sue and Sally. Secret agent, secret agent man. Alrighty, that was Mel Torme with Secret Agent Man. You're listening to Untamed Dimensions with Adam Go Rightly, and our guests today are Iona Miller and Charles Stone. You there, gang? Oh yeah, I'm here. Um, Charles, uh, one other thing when we're sure. talking about the uh, Nazi uh, technology, how, how deeply did the uh, Nazis get into mind control? Well, you know, I've um uh I think that the the core of what of what we have what what became MK Ultra came partly from the the, the Nazi work uh, a, a certainly important part of it, but not all of it came from from that period of time. There was uh there was a group called uh, uh was a uh, British intelligence agency is there uh was there one of their MI6 agencies that's the British equivalent of the CIA. Which is which has been known as a Tavistock Institute and Clinic. Uh, this was a supposedly the premier mind control agency that uh, uh, that the MK Ultra came came from, uh, and uh, certainly the uh, uh, major impet- impetuous came from from that direction. But also an important part came from the uh, the, the Nazi development. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how much came from the Nazi part and how much came from uh, uh, Tavistock, um, but there's evidence that Tavistock certainly precedes the, the, the Nazi era and so forth. It goes back to the early part of the century, prior to the time of its uh, of its uh, uh, you know official origin, 
And, and if start, I could say, uh, Tavistock yeah. had a social engineering agenda based on utopianism. Right. As part of its root in psychotherapy. Right, and it goes back to there's a major movement in, in Britain for um, uh, you know Fabian socialism and so forth, and uh, other things that go back to the later part of the 19th uh, century that, that led to, to Tavistock. And, of course, the uh, the grievous casualties that occurred during the uh, the First World War, that there was an effort to to, to do something to uh, for the, the men that were still alive who had these, uh, uh, what we would call post-traumatic stress syndrome, an extreme example, cases of them. And there were many, the, the royal family was sincerely involved with this to try to help it and to help the help these people along with the, the world's most famous psychiatrist, uh, Sigmund Freud. And this led to the start of uh, Tavistock, the official start of it. And it was originally well-intentioned to, to try to do something for these um, survivors of uh, the horrors of, of, of World War One. And eventually this was changed in its influence through the 1930s to the 1940s, and uh, it became uh, the, the modern-day form of uh, Tavistock. Uh, they're the people who actually took apart the mind of uh, Rudolf Hess. Perhaps you, you recall him. He was the deputy Führer of, uh, of the, uh, you know, to the uh, paper hanger himself, and you know, Adolf Hitler. And uh, he was uh, he had a secret agenda that he believed the British royalty would would uh, sign an agreement to uh, uh, some sort of a uh, uh, agreement with the, uh, the Nazis, uh, uh, so they wouldn't uh, non aggression pact or something like that. And he was the, the leader who was the most uh, nozzle about all the secret programs that were going on and the occult programs of the uh, for of, of the Nazi period. And uh, he was uh, uh, he flew a plane, a, a German fighter plane, in, to to England and landed there on the estate of one of the uh, dukes uh, of the country and one of the uh, members of the key members of the royal family. And he and uh, eventually he was uh, uh, he was take he was put in charge, the people from Tavistock uh, were uh, were put in, in in charge of him, and they actually took his mind apart to find out what was going on, and they put yeah. it back to, together again. And, of course, he became the man in the tower, the man in the in the Spandau prison in, in Berlin, who was held for decades in that one person in that tower. And, of course, we all know about the, 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 the Tower of London and the people who were held in that, but this is uh, much more... Recent story, and this one person was held in this tower for many years, and he was. Um, and there are many stories about him. I won't go, go into it, but he was the deputy Führer, and he was. And the, all these topics are inter, 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 interrelated. Let's say you know. <laughs> how uh, deeply is occultism rooted in all of this, and how has it extended into the modern, uh, you know? Era with when the uh, CIA got involved with MK Ultra. I don't know. Um, um, I, well, maybe I better say uh, I, I don't know. Can, can, can you take that one? Well, yeah. I've developed sort of a catchphrase, which is "Scratch a magus and find a spook." Uh, the history of the occult being linked to espionage goes back at least as far as the Elizabethan era, and probably before, with the shenanigans of Dr. John D. And in particular, uh, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, both of whom were known to be spies. Also, uh, Saint Germain has a reputation of having been a spy as well as a major occultist. All of these people, of course, being associated with secret societies that also had social engineering agendas, generally to move away from uh, royalty toward more democratic processes. You mentioned uh, E. Howard Hunt in an email and his involvement in occultism. Uh, I hadn't heard that before. Many have alleged that, uh, well, Hunt was involved, a uh, former CIA agent, in all kinds of uh, shenanigans from the uh, Kennedy assassination to the uh, whole Watergate uh, thing. That's right, and uh, maybe it was no accident that he lived on Witch's Island in the D.C. area. Um, the source for that story is another of the MRU principals who was, among other things, their remote viewer and time traveler. They did remote viewing at MRU a little differently than they were at SRI. Uh, 
And he's the one who told me that Hunt was very much into the occult, and again, his interest had been piqued because he also had a connection to the exorcist story. And that started him off investigating the occult. And, of course, uh, early on, um, you could say that espionage, the first three letters of that are ESP, and so this, you know, psychotronic means of gathering intelligence was certainly part of it, as well as the spy versus spy part of it of psychic attacks on one another. Now, uh, could you uh, talk, Iona, about your uh, forthcoming article in uh, Paranoia, the Conspiracy Reader, on uh, Tom Bearden? Uh, yes. Uh, the same fellow who I was talking about as MRU's time traveler uh, was a main sidekick and an in t- uh, science consultant with Tom Bearden in developing his zero-point theories. And, in fact, Tom attributes him with saving his life. Uh, And who is this? Well, I'd rather not mention his name on the air. Uh, We can call him KT for short. Anyway, he introduced me to Tom, and I talked to Tom pretty extensively about his work. Uh, But we can't call that an official interview because he's not allowed to do interviews, he Mm -hmm. says, by a certain three-letter acronym agency and that's a condition of his continuing protection there. So, uh, again, the the article there in Paranoia is a review of his extension of Tesla-type theories into zero-point energy and his applications into uh, uh, over-unity machines. Um, You mentioned time travel, uh and this KT fellow uh, mm-hmm. who is also involved with uh, one of the Alphabet Soup uh, agencies. Has he actually time-traveled? What's going on with that? Well, I I was uh, being his science sidekick for a number of months when suddenly he heard on the Art Bell Show, he heard uh, Frank Sumption talking about his EVP uh, research. And he got into that himself. It rekindled an interest that he had in using uh, radio signals and these other things in order to get messages from the beyond. So he went into that very heavily, and I would call what he does radical EVP, uh, because he, he... didn't do it in the conventional sense of listening to ghosts. It was like surveillance on the future. And he keeps himself thoroughly isolated from all uh, normal media. He doesn't see films. He has no references in terms of pop culture or whatever so that he can maintain this sort of clear channel aspect of himself so that he doesn't have random input uh, in terms of that. So I wrote an article about what he was doing and what he learned from the future uh, that you could find on one of my sites. If you just Google Iona Miller plus EVP, it would probably come up. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, that's what, electronic voice phenomenon. What did he learn from the future? Well, he made a report from a couple of hundred years in the future, and there had been some kind of more democratic revolution, and that people were running their vehicles on thorium. Uh, they lived in smaller communities. People didn't don't get around like they do now. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, a lot of it was snippets, but while he was doing that work and using his equipment, uh, they would call out his name as if they knew who they were talking to, and he said to the point where his wife, you know, two rooms away, could hear it and hear it loudly. And uh, as a matter of fact, she had worked for MRU herself, and Carl had introduced the two of them. Uh, she worked in the super learning program. That, that sounds like uh, remote viewing via some type of high tech, uh, high technology. Well, actually, he really likes Mm low-tech. And uh, he talked about tunnel diodes and back diodes, and, you know, that's kind of Greek for me. Mm -hmm. But I did, you know, 
certainly uh, jot it all down and put it in my article. So for those to whom it speaks more loudly, it's there for them to glean what they can from it for their own yeah. pursuits. Uh, what the two of us did is kind of rescue Frank Sumption from his, you know, uh, his Art Bell brought him so much attention he kind of imploded on himself. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, now I understand he's quite well on track. Uh, earlier in the show you folks mentioned uh, psychotronics, uh, which can be used for both good or ill, how can they be used for good and ill? Well, could could you start that? Uh, I well, I think the whole New Age movement has kind of shown how they can be used for good, if you want to call that good. Uh, it may just be another form of mind control and another bizarre paradigm or uh, wormhole, <laughs> reality wormhole. But uh, everybody knows that... that uh, we all have these sort of telepathic communications when, you know, you think about someone and suddenly the phone rings and whatnot. And we all have that latent ability. And originally a cult uh, just meant developing those latent abilities. There was nothing dark or pernicious about it. It was mm -hmm. just hidden. You're, you're, well, talking, you're talking about psychic abilities, but uh, psychotronics... Uh, Themselves. Well, all, all psychotronics don't involve electronics. Mm -hmm. They don't. <laughs> well, it, the uh, a lot of some of the darker stories linked to uh, psychotronics have been these type of electronic equipment that are supposedly being used to, uh, you know, mind control people. Well, that's right, and there are a lot of people that call themselves TIs, targeted individuals, mm -hmm. who claim that they are the victims of uh, governmental, not only surveillance, but experimentation on them bodily, and they have a variety of symptoms that they attribute to that, from voices being piped into their minds to... Uh, you know, skin problems and all kinds of uh, internal ailments. Well, Tom Bearden claimed back in the uh, 70s that the Russians were bombarding us with this type of technology. And that's right. That started off with our embassy, and then that was a project called Woodpecker. Yeah. And uh, one of my local towns here, Medford, Oregon, was actually supposed to be one of the logical targets of that, and they claimed the aim there was to create apathy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did it work? <laughs> well, the jury's still out. Another uh, place in Oregon, Eugene, uh, they've... Been, they've uh, People have claimed that it has also been a, a target of something going on. Sort That's of right. Like that was a woodpecker target as well. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now, um, I don't know. Do you do you think the psychiatric the uh, psychotronic signals would be effective at that distance they were trying to? Uh, well, let me just interject that the uh, the famous uh, you know where the uh, famous uh, uh, n n nuclear re reactor had the problems in the, the in, in the Ukraine the uh, Chernobyl reactor. That that reactor was an old, pretty crude Soviet design. That that its sole function was to uh, power a, a transmitter, a special type of uh, transmitter that transmitted these uh, psychotronic signals. And there was some question about whether the psychotronic signals actually occur, caused the uh, were a factor in the problem the problems with the reactor that had, you know, very old, very sloppily run, you know. But uh, it was. Uh, but that's a, uh, another point that people don't, it's not well known that these signals were started on July 4th of 1976 and that the um, they were targeted, the Soviets thought they would be able to affect the country, change the people's minds. I'm, I'm not sure whether they whether it, whether the signals were even effective at that distance, you know. Well, but, it, according to Bearden's theories, that's a non-local scalar signal and distance doesn't affect it in the least. Non-local, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what's uh, Tom Bearden up to these days? Is he still around? Yes, he is, but his health is somewhat failing now as well as he's the caregiver for his wife. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But he still maintains his active interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, there was also a Hollywood interest in psychotronics too. I don't know if people are interested or not, but uh, but one of the er- uh, Sharon Stone's early films was as uh, in the um, psychotronic world or a psychotronic woman or, or something, and her uh, travels to to Mars and and so forth. But uh, it's also been in uh, in uh, going back to the nineteen early nineteen eighties or seventies that this was of, of interest in Hollywood too. Yeah. Now, Iona, in uh, one of the emails you uh, sent me, you uh, said, quote, I believe I'm the first conspiracy geek invited in from the cold. Even I don't know if I'm a mole or not. What do you, <laughs> what you mean by that cryptic uh, statement? Well, in terms of MRU, it just seems that it was so spooky that none of us can agree on what the story actually was. It wasn't mm-hmm. that we're... Uh, countering one another's arguments, but we all have different pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. And some of us have different interpretations of that puzzle. And what I'm talking about is uh, I was a writer for Nexus magazine as well, and often you'd hear people who had a five-minute clandestine phone booth conversation with somebody from the such and such. And, of course, there the, the agency we love to hate is always the CIA. Well, uh, I had met Charles Stone, and later I told you I met KT, and one day KT would have asked, asked me, would I like to meet his friend from the CIA? And so I said, er, uh, sure, <laughs> and uh, proceeded to do that. So I feel like I have a rather unique, because of my own background in uh, uh, blue sky science, and I'm still writing uh on things like quantum bioholography for the Journal of Non-Locality and Remote Mental Interaction, that I have sort of a unique relationship here because I have people from quite a few organizations, uh, some of which have the science background. And also, uh, Dr. Stanley Krippner was another one of the principals uh, on Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain, and he and I both served on the board of the Sclapia Foundation for several years and got to know one another quite well. Uh, Previously in the 70s, he had published some of Rick Miller's uh, work in Curlian Photography and the Holographic Concept of Reality. So, you know, we keep coming back to this same small group of players where we intersect over and over. Yeah, each one of us have a different view of, of uh, mankind research because we were played a different role at different times, and uh, it was all, um, you know, Carl never said very much. He didn't. We I knew some of what he'd done in the past, but 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 not all of it. And of course, that's for everybody's protection. They they did that too. Did uh, MRU get into uh, psychedelic research at all with mind expanding agents? Not to my knowledge, that no, was not. No, I don't know. But I think yeah. he, did, he did like that, no. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to take a little departure, and I might have asked you this question uh, before, Iona, but i like to ask all my guests uh, if you've ever seen a UFO. Well, you did ask me before, and I said I had one sighting in Los Angeles in the, oh, around 1967, I'd say. The Summer of Love? The summer of love. <laughs> and then uh, out in the Nevada desert, I had a an anomalous occurrence uh, that I had likened on your other show to maybe per- perhaps uh, a Tesla shield. Mm. It, it wasn't a flying object, but a big, brilliant bubble that looked like the sun was coming up, but to the west, which at that time of the evening it would not be doing. And Charles? Well, I hate to say this, but I you know, I, uh, I believe that there are UFOs and they really occur and all these things, but I've never actually seen one myself. I, in my latest business trip to uh, Nevada, I actually went out to uh, uh, to the famous little uh, place with the, the, the little the, the little alien. Yeah, been there. And uh, with uh, met one of my one of my people I work with on these projects, and he was there for a week to observe things and so forth. These and projects. I, <laughs> on these uh, on these books, the books, uh-huh. you know, and uh, he was there spent the whole week trying to observe. He he never said what he exactly saw there, but I was there for one part of one evening with him looking, and I I never saw anything. We were right looking at right over Area 51, you know, and so forth. 
and uh, but I hate to say this, but I've, I've never actually seen one, but I do do believe they occur. Mm-hmm. Now we need to uh, start wrapping up here. Uh, thanks both of you for coming on. I'll give you an opportunity to uh, you know direct us to any websites or uh, any other information we need to know about to find out more about uh, Iona Miller and Charles Stone. Let's start with you, Iona. Uh, 